benefit with wheelchair access. You can find more information on kpfa.org. It's 2.30 on KPFA, KPFB, Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It's time for Pushing Limits. Welcome to Pushing Limits, a program by, for, and about folks living with disabilities. I'm Shelley Berman here with Adrian Lobby. We air here on KPFA 94.1 FM on the first, third, and fifth Fridays of every month from 2.30 to 3 p.m. This is the fifth Friday, and it's our good fortune to introduce you to one of the most fun, focused, determined, driven, and loving persons on the planet. Her name is Madeleine Kelly. The universe aligned and allowed Adrian and I to meet Maddie. When she isn't bouncing off the walls like Tigger... <laughs> Maddie is as cuddly as Pooh Bear. Oh, perhaps I did and forgot. Sweet as Piglet. Oh, no. It's really nothing at all. And wise as Owl. Oh, I see. A running trophy. I'd recognize one anywhere. Not much like Eeyore. I know no one cares except me. At least not for too long. Maddie lives with ADHA, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity, and she has worked hard to find peace within her mind. So buckle up. This is one ride you won't forget. My name is Madeleine Kelly. My friends call me Maddie. And I define myself as um, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive, ADHA, um, as defined for me by others who would wanted me to have a definition and I assume you had this from childhood very much so yeah but I'm 56 years old so when I was coming up through the system there were no drugs there was nothing except to you know keep throwing you out of the classroom so I was fortunate because I wasn't medicated so I could still be creative <laughs> when did you get a diagnosis I was lay diagnosed by everyone around me for many, many years. They kept saying I was ADD, and that didn't sit with me because I focus extremely well. I accomplish tasks, so I refused the diagnosis of ADD until I ran into a teacher who said, no, you're not ADD, you're ADHA. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, you're, you're hyperactive, you're attention deficit hyperactive, which means that you have to be moving, you have to be doing things all the time, but you focus really well for short periods of time. And that made sense. And when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was 40 years old, and when she was born, I decided that I would go to a therapist and do the testing because I wanted to understand what my impact may or may not be on her. Am I correct in assuming that as a child you really didn't know what was going on, you just felt different? No one knew what was going on. It was very, very challenging. It was challenging for my parents, who were immigrants from the UK. I was the third child, as usual, with Catholic families. We were a year apart, basically. They were borderline poverty, building themselves into middle class, which you could do in the 1950s. So they didn't have a lot of time to deal with a difficult child, and that was my label, difficult just difficult acting out you're always acting out what did you feel about yourself I saw people I saw them from a very young age I had a really strong intuition and I wanted to talk to people I wanted to tell them what I was thinking I had as my newest best friend tells me I had uh, an emotor mouth right so when I emoted it came out my mouth so I would blurt a lot. I had a very hard time containing. Like in a room, there always was a comment for me to make. But that's incredibly disruptive for classrooms of 35 kids and teachers and at home with your parents who just really want to 
shuttle you from one thing to the next to keep everybody moving, right? Obviously, you got a lot of negative attention. As you look back, how did that affect you? It was very, very, very difficult childhood. I was very cognizant that I was having a difficult childhood. There was no sanctuary for me, no place that I felt safe. At home, my older brother and sister picked on me. We had another baby, and she was five years younger, so she got that attention. My parents, as I said, were really busy just making making way. I started to run when I was basically five years old. I went to school very early because my mom didn't know what to do with me. So they put me in school when I was five and I was really, really tiny. I was always really tiny. And so I heard there was a cross country race and I entered it. Five years old. <laughs> At five years old you decided to enter a cross country race. That's awesome, Maddie. Awesome. Yeah, I did. And I was so tiny, like super tiny. But I had this big voice. I don't know if you've ever read John Irving. The prayer for Owen Meany was me. I had this big voice in these calves. So I ran this cross-country race, and I came so far last. Here's this little tiny thing coming, little tiny thing coming. Here she goes. And everyone clapped and cheered for me. And I thought, I like that. That's attention I like. So I think I'll do more of that running thing. Now, I spent the next probably 25 years being in the middle of the pack. <laughs> so I didn't get a lot of cheering after that. When I went and got that diagnosed at 40, the uh, therapist said that athleticism, running especially, because I could do it anywhere, anyhow, anytime, I didn't need equipment, I didn't need anybody else, saved my life, like literally saved my life, because I was able to burn off that top energy, right, that energy that it's really, really frenetic, and I was able to burn that off by athletics and then that calmed me down so then I could go on to the next thing and the next thing and to this day that's I'm still like that when the therapist said that was she talking about a physiological you might have been killed because of over energy or people around you might have taken out the long knives I wanted to kill myself that's what happens is the loneliness so it's, it's not being alone as much as it is having no one to connect with there was a few adults that i connected with and one of my close friends that i would credit for saving my life was an obese woman bertha Facaro was her name <laughs> bertha saved my life because i would go and pick up her groceries for her and bring them back and i would just hang out with her all the time so i would run and hang out with bertha because i didn't need to do homework because my homework was done in school time my homework was done in 10 minutes and i was on the honor roll and i spent most of my time in the hallways i didn't i planned my suicide i was very very planned about it so i babysat at that time i i was making my own money because i needed to be in control of my life what at what age it was about 10 or 11 when i started to plot my suicide and what i did and i was smart so this was not very smart <laughs> clearly i just wanted to be rescued i would steal aspirin from all the places I babysat, I'd skim the top of them. So I would take, you know, five or ten here, five or ten there. So no one would ever notice that they were missing anything. And I saved them up and I saved them up and I saved them up. Then one night, I took like 30 or 40 aspirin, right? And I thought, you know, we'll see. I did not think that that would kill me. But I thought I would at least get an understanding of maybe, you know, we'll see how this goes and maybe I'll take more or whatever. It really didn't do much to me. I didn't feel well, but it really didn't do much to me. And I never told anyone. I never told anyone. But nobody noticed. That was the big failure that nobody noticed. What came of that? Well, interestingly, the rest of those aspirin, which I had several hundred of them were in a Kleenex in my top drawer of my dresser. They'd been sitting there for six months because now I'm still like, what am I going to do? What am I gonna do? I, I've actually, you know, kind of moved past. I'm not really thinking about it that much. I'm, I'm doing something else. I can't remember what I'm, what I'm up to at that time. And my mother finds them and she confronts me. She said, what are all these aspirins doing in your dresser? I could never lie to my mother. So when I lied, my whole face would turn beet red. Like, there's no question I'm lying. And I stood in front of her and I said, oh, those aspirin. Oh, my friend has these allergies. You gotta remember, we're talking about like 1960s here, early 70s. It's not like today. She has these allergies and she asked me to hold them for her. And my mother looked at me and she said, hmm, and just kept the aspirin. Never asked me another question about it. 
tell us what that was like inside of you. It's hard to describe because it's been so long since I've felt that way. It's worse than loneliness because loneliness is about being alone. When you have no connection and feel like you're a mistake and told continuously that you're difficult and you're trouble, you know, you ruin Christmas again with all your behaviors and acting out and you're just a performer and everybody thought that I would be an actress. What they didn't understand is that it was desperate. It was, it was desperate. Yeah, that's what it was. Was molestation part of wanting to end your life? No, I was molested when I was, I think I must have been 10, by our neighbor. I was quite clear that he was wrong, and I just stayed away from him. I was very, very conscious. I could see people. I was babysitting for this family. It's a good backstory. The wife would hire me to babysit while the husband was home, so I would play with the children. So they wouldn't bother him because he was a helicopter pilot, as I recall. I just removed myself from the situation. It was very clear to me when he was touching me. And I kind of, you know, wasn't sure, you know, whatever. And then it was bugging me. And then he asked me to take my clothes off. And I said, you know what? No, I'm not going to take my clothes off. And he said, I thought we were friends. And I said, friends don't ask friends to do that. I said that at the age of 10 and walked out the door. Now we're going to fast forward. Was there a, a year, an incident, a moment where you got a hint that you weren't crazy, they all were? I left. I always knew I needed to leave. I needed to leave my family. I loved my family, but I needed to leave them. I needed to find my people. How old were you when you left? Uh, 18. As soon as I could. As soon as I could. My parents kicked me out several times. <laughs> they kicked me out, and then they said, you know, get back here, uh, because it was illegal. And, uh, you know, what are we doing there? So I had everything planned. My birthday is December 19th, so I had everything planned. February 1, I had a place to live. I had everything taken care of, and I moved out. And I started to find my way. Probably the biggest aha for me was I moved up north to Fort McMurray, which is where the oil sands are in Canada. And I met a man there, not a boy. I met a man. He was about 10 years older than me. And he is, was and is absolutely brilliant. He works in organizational development and very conscious person. And when I met him, he said to me, how have you survived? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, who do you talk to? Like, you got all this, like, who do you talk to? And I said, I just talk and mostly, you know, people don't listen. Some adults when I was young listen, but, you know, I just talk. And he said, you are extraordinary. He told me I was extraordinary. And I basked in the glow of his attention. And I lived with him for about four and a half years. And he is still a very close friend of mine. And I would say that he saw me. He saw me. What would people see if they see you now? People see me as extremely successful. I definitely package out in society well. From my looks, my physicality, my intelligence, my sense of humor. I'm a really well-rounded individual. And I like people, and I care about them, and I see them. So I take the experiences that I had, and I don't forget one of them, not any of them. And I try to see others, whether it's grocery shopping and saying hello to the clerk and letting them know that I appreciate them and I see them. The smallest of things make the biggest impacts in the world. And you still have the same ADHA mind. Well, you're probably very poor, barely making it, right? <laughs> uh, no. I don't worry about money. I spend all my money all the time. I bought a number of properties. That's a good place for me to plant money. I don't like planting money into the stock market or anything else like that because then I would be looking at it all the time and I would be a distraction. And I have to be really careful. That's, that's one thing that's really important. I'd be careful with distraction. I don't watch television. I don't have a television in my home. I do watch a lot of things on the Internet documentaries, half-hour sitcoms. I don't watch a lot of movies because it's a bit too long 
for me, for my attention span. And, and also, it's kind of like junk food. I don't eat a lot of junk food. I eat some, but I don't eat a lot. Every day above ground for me is super precious. I have a partner for the last 21 years, and we have a really, really unique relationship. We're not married. We have gone through many things together. He was diagnosed bipolar when our daughter was four years old. We have a beautiful daughter who's 15 now. We tend to live in different places, different countries, different homes, and we come together at different times. We are completely monogamous, insane about each other, and insane. And um, <laughs> like, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. Let's dive in a little bit to your partner's disability and how that interacts with yours and how, how do you two cope and make a life for your daughter? The biggest thing is he was late diagnosed bipolar. He's very mild bipolar. So he doesn't, you know, go drain the bank account, you know, have sex with other people. He doesn't do any of that stuff. It was very hard for me to even know what was going on with him because he didn't know either. But his mania is very inner you don't see it on the outside his brain begins to fire really really fast to the point when he went into his big bipolar episode when he was diagnosed he couldn't read a page of a book and he's an english lit major right he couldn't read a page of a book because his brain couldn't focus he couldn't sleep when he's going into episodes when his chemistry is changing his brain chemistry changes he starts having nightmares so we know like he starts having nightmares and it's awful. His nightmares are always about me being torn apart, my limbs being torn off of me, our daughter being on fire, just really, really horrible, horrible things. And laying next to him, you see him just absolutely in the depths of despair in his sleep. And then he'll wake up in the morning, I'll say, you know, how are you? And he'll be a bit despondent and difficult. And that's hard for me because I wake up every morning just, wee, right? But he doesn't. So then the depressive side is there. I try to stay out of his way. When he's like that, I can't fix him, and I want to fix him, but I can't fix him. So my daughter is extremely aware of both of us and who we are and what our brain chemistries are. We've also had her with a psychologist, so she knows what her brain is like. And I recommend everyone find out. Find out who you are. Find out what your brain chemistry is. And then you can navigate this world in a better place for yourself. Because it's know thyself. Nobody else is going to take care of you as well as you will take care of yourself. But you have to know yourself first. It's not a disability. It's your ability. And when my boyfriend was diagnosed... He resisted it because it meant that his brain was bad. And our therapist, who is an amazing Jungian therapist, she said, you have a brilliant brain. You're tuned to Pushing Limits here on KPFA 94.1 FM. Today we're speaking with Madeleine Kelly. Maddie lives with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity, or ADHA, a chronic condition including attention difficulty, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness. Maddie has figured out how to harness this, so she runs it. It don't run her, and she runs very fast indeed. Sorry, Wild E. Coyote. No chance of any anvil catching this roadrunner. <laughs> We're doing this interview here at the Monterey Airport. We're outside, and it is such a metaphor, Maddie, not only because you're flying all around the world and taking your passion wherever you go, but just that... Your brain is constantly in motion. <laughs> Hear this, Maddie's brain. <laughs> well, it, it's definitely powerful. <laughs> Let's talk about the things that uh, your brain has given you as gifts. I focus extremely well for short periods of time. So one of the things that happened was when I, when I went to the therapist to get diagnosed when I was 40, I had three companies. And I said, should I stop doing something? Like, and he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, you'll just do something else. You'll just add something. If you drop something, you'll just add something. And finishing things is important for you to do. Stay on finishing. So he encouraged me to continue to do all the things that I do. So I do. 
I just, I do lots of things. I'm, uh, I plan my life really, really well in a, in a free fall of planning. But, you know, I'm here. I came to Esalen to do a workshop. Every month I plan a trip. I like to run. I don't run every day. I'm not fanatic about it. But I'll go and do a half marathon in the desert so I can see what the foliage is like in the desert. Because when you run for three hours, you get a really good sense of foliage. <laughs> You know, there's not a lot of distraction. Uh, running is running has been a real big gift for me. I've done some cycling as well. That's good. Anything where I'm I'm doing something for two or three hours calms everything down. So exercise has been a big gift for me, a really big gift. You run businesses, so you have competitors. Is there ways that your brain gives you an advantage over neurotypical brains? Well, the interesting thing about me is my banker said to me a few years ago, many years ago, he said, you ought not to tell your banker how many things you do. Because <laughs> it scares us. <laughs> Into not giving you loans? Absolutely. Yeah. He, yeah. Like they want to see focus and they want to see singular focus. So if you're saying, you know, well, I'm going to do that. And then, and then when I get that done, then I'm going to do this over here and da, 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 da. Um, they don't like that. So that was his advice to me. In business, I, I do find that it is important to be focused. I am focused in my business more than ever. But what I'm doing now is I'm working less. So at one time, I had two showrooms. I was working in furniture. I had two retail showrooms. And I had a, a bistro in one, an organic bistro. And this is going back 20 years. So I was doing an organic bistro 20 years ago. And um, I had an event design company. And I did catering. Then I, I was pregnant with my daughter. And uh, we were struggling because she kept leaving. So I was pregnant four times. So the fourth time, she decided I was serious enough about it that she stayed. <laughs> so... I had to devote some attention because she was a preemie and she was two and a half pounds and I was back and forth to the hospital. So I shut one of my businesses down at that time. And I find now that I like to have multiple interests. I don't want to turn everything I love to do into a business. I don't cater anymore. I cook food for my friends. I still design food. I eat a plant-based diet, which has been very consuming for me. I'm working on a book called The Intentional Diet. So you're now trying to transition into some new endeavors. So talk to us about that specifically. Well, I'm keeping what I like about what I do in my work, which is I travel around the world and I source furniture. So I like that. I don't want to do it six or seven days a week. So I only do that four days a week, about six hours a day. And I see that in a year being even less. I then research and work on my book and the lecture series that I'm designing and a workshop for, uh, on empowerment for children. Because I want children to understand that when you're eight years old, everyone is in control of you so what can you have control over you can have control over your mind because your mind is what's going to direct your brain it's the steering wheel to your brain it directs where you're gonna go I you rode a motorcycle for many years and they always say on a motorcycle look where you're going because where your eyes are looking, that's where you're going to go. And that's what the mind is. The mind is a steering wheel to the brain. So steer. Don't let other people tell you what you should be thinking. And don't let your thoughts control you. So in your ADHA, is that your mind or is that your brain? Oh, the brain is the ADHA part. So the mind, I control the ADHA, the chemistry of my brain. I control the chemistry by controlling the mind. But part of the chemistry is physical. Remember that. Like, it's, a, it's, it's real. It's not like, oh, if you, you know, I'm like that. It's real. And it fires that way. So I exercise. I get sunshine. I don't eat sugar. <laughs> I don't not eat sugar. But I don't eat sugar much. I, just because I don't want to. Because it fires me up. I have a hard time sleeping as it is. I do like wine <laughs> it's a depressive you didn't hear that 
because of the airplane, but she likes wine. It's a depressive. Yeah, judicious use. I, I always say to people, you have to know what is in your toolbox. What tools have you got to go through this world? Because there's so many stories and constructions that people are going to put on you. They're going to tell you you're ADHA and there's your box and go sit in it. Bottom line is, that's just a framework for you to understand yourself and how your brain works. So then you can take that and you can decide what you want to do. That's the mind directing the brain. That's the important piece, the big important piece. That's how you can get through this world and have it work for you rather than you working for it. We only have a couple of minutes left. Can you share with us how it has been for you to have a daughter, to have a child, and what she's meant to you in your life? My daughter is my favorite toy. She is for sure the best thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, she's the most compassionate, kind person. I often say to people, I say, my daughter is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And they sort of think, but she's your daughter, like you talk about her like she's this person that you've met. And I say, yes, I meet her every day. I see her new. Krishnamurti, who's one of my mentors in the world, Krishnamurti said, when you see something familiar, like a tree, there's a tree in your yard when you come home every day is the tree. Do you see the tree or do you drop a veil over your eyes of a picture of the tree that you already know is there? And most of us, that's what we do. We don't see each other, especially if we live together or we spend lots of time together. What we do is we drop a veil over our eyes of the person that we already know is there so we don't see them. I see my daughter every day and she sees me that's the gift the present it sounds like you have a pretty good life do you like your life oh i love my life i love my life so much it's it's so precious every day is so precious to me thanks for listening thank you maddie for exposing your dazzling innermost self Adrian and I had the privilege to attend a workshop called the max expanding the limits of your self-expression Thank you to all the participants. It was a once-in-a-lifetime, unforgettable five days that facilitated the ultimate life waxing. Just like life, it was mighty painful at times, but in the end, John Lennon was right. Underneath it all, all the pain, all the trauma, all the dis-ease, love is all there is. Pushing Limits is produced by a collective of people with disabilities. Contact us at 510-848-6767, extension 636, or by email at pushinglimits, all one word, at kpfa.org. Our website is pushinglimitsradio.org, and we're on Facebook as Pushing Limits Radio. We'll be back next week, and then February 19th, we'll be asking for your financial support to make sure that Disability Radio stays loud and proud here on KPFA. Until then... KPFA's annual Grateful Dead Fundraising Marathon is happening on Saturday, February 20th from 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. Pacific Time. 
We'll have lots of rare unreleased music, a live performance or two, interviews, and other fun stuff for 16 thrilling hours. If you're in the Berkeley area, you might want to come by and work the phones for a while. It's actually a lot of fun. The marathon will be webcast via gdradio.net and kpfa.org, so tell your friends all over the planet so they can be part of the fun, too. It's the KPFA Grateful Dead Marathon with Tim Lynch and me, David Gans, Saturday, February 20th from 9 a.m. to 